Hello, I'm Caroline Cruz, President and CEO of the Platelet Disorder Support Association. Welcome to PDSA's Facebook Live program, COVID-19 and ITP Part 2, an update to the town hall PDSA brought to you in early April, when the coronavirus pandemic was still quite new. Now that we've learned so much more about this virus and its impact on the general population, and those with underlying health conditions and rare disorders like ITP, we bring you this new program. And since it is live, we will take your questions for our panel of world-renowned experts. In addition, this program is a kickoff to PDSA's ITP Conference 2020, which is our 20th annual conference. If you haven't registered yet for the conference taking place Saturday, August 1st and Sunday, August 2nd, you still have time. Please go to the PDSA website to register and at pdsa.org, you'll find the conference agenda listing all of the important educational sessions along with our lineup of leading ITP experts for this year's conference. We now have more than 600 registered attendees representing 19 countries. For those of you who have registered for ITP Conference 2020, you'll receive your login information by the end of the day. If you find you don't have it by Friday morning, please check your junk or your spam email box in case it lands there. And if you still don't find it, please contact the PDSA office. We're also planning a technology test on Friday evening from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern time. This will give our attendees a chance to get on the platform and navigate around to hopefully avoid any issues on Saturday morning with accessing the platform or the content. We'll have our virtual help desk open at that time to troubleshoot any technology issues that'll come up. The help desk will also be available during the entire conference should you encounter any tech issues during the weekend. Today's program, which will include the most up-to-date COVID-19 information, includes presentations by leading hematologists and immunologists, along with experts on vaccines and plasma therapies for COVID-19. And now to kick off the conversation is PDSA medical advisor, Dr. James Bussell, world-renowned ITP expert and professor at Weill Cornell Medical Center in New York. We're very grateful to Dr. Bussell for coordinating all of today's speakers. Dr. Bussell? Thank you very much, Caroline. And I think it's great that PDSA is willing to put the time and effort into doing this. And I think we found it valuable before and hopefully will again today. <clears throat> in brief, we're going to hear about treatments of the disease. We're going to hear about its effects in immunodeficient patients. We're going to hear about convalescent plasma and developments for hyperimmune IgG. We're going to hear about vaccinations and we're going to hear about the issues with it in thrombosis. And then we're going to turn it over and have three people, including myself, discuss what we've learned in ITP itself, specifically in patients who were infected. So the first speaker from the NIAID from the NIH, and I believe everybody now knows what NIAID is, courtesy of Dr. Fauci, the country's leading expert on COVID, we're going to hear from Steve Holland, um, to tell us about treatments for the disease and a little about pathophysiology. We're very grateful, Steve, that you're joining us again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. It's really a great uh, honor and a pleasure to be here. I think the work that the PDSA, PDSA has been doing is so critical in terms of being sure that we all get to hear um, what's going on in this uh, disease that has really transformed the world in which we live. So I'll try and be very uh, brief and to the point and uh, be happy to take questions when it's done. If I could have the first slide, please. So um, I'm gonna be talking about uh, the disease and treatment. And if you have the virus, what should you do? Are the slides up? There we go. So, um, you know, what can you do if you get infected? This is really a, a key question. So the first slide, next slide, please. The most important thing that I have to remind you about is if you get sick, stay home. 
Uh, it's not a great thing to spread. Um, this is where you show your love by uh, doing less. And so if you get sick or you think you're sick, stay home and keep it to yourself. If you are around other humans and all of us hope to be at some point in our lives, wear a mask. Do not believe the stuff that you hear about how masks are bad for you or uh, difficult. And um, despite what I might think about Madonna's music, her opinions on mask wearing are not helpful. So masks are important. They really, really stop the spread of infection. There is no single thing that we could do that's more effective. Next slide. So <clears throat> I wanna just cover a couple of very brief things that come up again and again. So if you get sick, what do you need to know about when you can return to normal? Now, the CDC has been working very hard to come up with solid information about this. And over the last few months, uh, these are the recommendations that have been arrived at. Right now, we're mostly on a time-based strategy. So if you get sick, then if you wait 10 days after your symptoms appeared and 24 hours with no fever, then, and you otherwise feel okay, then you can go back to normal life. At that point, we think that you are not any longer infectious or a risk. Now, there are some groups that are still doing test-based strategies, which is fine. And if you're on a test-based strategy using like nasal swabs or throat swabs, then you want to have no fever. The respiratory symptoms, which are so characteristic, should be improved and you need two tests 24 hours apart. Because testing is hard to come by and, and cumbersome, many places, including the NIH, have moved to a time-based strategy. Next slide. But if you are a healthcare worker, the information I just gave is if you are um, not a healthcare worker. If you're a healthcare worker and otherwise healthy, then it's 10 days from your first positive viral test, assuming that everything gets better. If you are asymptomatic and you're not immunocompromised, it's 10 days from your test. If you were really sick or if you are really immunocompromised, and this might be important to um, some of the people uh, here on our, our conference, um, then it's 20 days from symptom appearance. And although this applies to healthcare workers, it's something that we should all be thinking about. And this is because if you're severely immunocompromised, you might have trouble clearing the virus completely. So 20 days from symptoms and 24 hours from the last fever and uh, overall improved. Next slide. So <clears throat> now I wanna just uh, pivot for a moment because as we talk about treatments, it's important that we talk about um, how we stratify the disease. And there are several different stratifications out there. I'm simply gonna talk about one of them that has been um, vetted and is one that's being used throughout uh, many of the studies that are being conducted. So we wanna see these five categories. Asymptomatic, that's pretty self-explanatory. Mild means um, people who feel lousy, but don't have any breathing trouble. Moderate means people who have pneumonia, but normal oxygen levels. Severe is when the oxygen level is below 94%, but they're only on supplemental oxygen and doing okay. And then critical means needing a lot of oxygen and or intensive care and or ventilation. You gotta keep this in mind though, next slide because it makes a difference in where we wind up uh, with our treatments. And so this is just, um, you know, you have to have a pyramid if you're gonna talk about anything and the more colors you put in the better. And so I've tried to include this here. But remember, we're gonna go from asymptomatic, mild, moderate, severe, and critical as we talk about different treatments. Next slide. Steve, can you press yep. on your slides? Because I don't think that the little, the buttons in the corner, I don't think we're seeing them. Oh, um, you're not. Uh, you're, uh, are you on? Uh, I don't have buttons in my corner, Jim. All right, 
Yeah, Dr. Busser, Dr. Bussell from the technical side here, everything's fine. Thanks. Please continue, Dr. Holland. Oh, sorry. So, um, so we were talking about the stratification into from asymptomatic to severe. And so what are the things that make you more likely to get into more trouble? What are those high risk conditions? And here I've just listed a standard set. This is taken from the CDC. You can have a more extensive group of um, risk factors, but these are the most obvious ones. Age is a critical factor for reasons that we don't yet understand. Maleness is a critical factor for reasons that we don't yet understand. And then many of the other things um, that you see here, cancer, kidney disease, lung disease, immune compromise, obesity for reasons we don't understand, as well as heart disease, sickle cell, and diabetes. Next slide. So <clears throat> now we've talked a little bit about risk factors. We've talked a little bit about how we um, refer to the different uh, things. So then let's talk about what are the actual treatments. And I'm only going to talk about the treatments that are demonstrated so far to be effective. Again, the most important thing is stay home. Try and not spread the disease. Don't go to the hospital unless you are sick and you need to be in one. Um, neither uh, exposure of you to other people nor of other people to you is going to be advantageous unless you need help, usually with breathing. And so if you begin to have trouble breathing, that's a good time to go. Finally, in this section, do not use hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine unless it's part of a trial. In this country, there are no longer trials of uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine going on because it does not seem to work for this disease. Next slide. But what are the things that do work? And there are two that I wanna talk about now. The first is remdesivir. It's an antiviral drug, a direct antiviral. And although it was designed to treat Ebola, it didn't work very well for that. But it does turn out to be very effective for this coronavirus. And what we saw in um, large randomized prospective trials is that people who got remdesivir while they were in the severe but not critical phase got better faster and uh, were discharged earlier. Next slide. So this is what the actual data uh, look like. And I've labeled here um, moderate, severe, and critical. And the only point I wanna take home here is that on the bottom left-hand corner, that uh, panel labeled severe is where you see a difference in the two curves between red placebo and blue remdesivir where they're well separated. In none of the other ones do you see major separations. That's reminding us that the antiviral was really important during that period when people were sick, but not so sick as to require big time care. So that's an antiviral. Now, next slide. The next drug to make sure to mention is dexamethasone, which is a steroid. And this of course is a big deal treatment for many of the people in, uh, in, uh, that have platelet disorders. And this is at the immunomodulatory end of therapy. And this drug clearly reduces death in those people who have severe and critical disease, but not in those who don't. Now, one of the great uh, uh, things about steroids is that loads of people all over the world have used them extensively. Next slide. And from uh, this paper just came out uh, two weeks ago in the New England Journal, what you see again is the separation here. You're looking for the lower curve means better outcome. And you can see those who got dexamethasone had better outcomes um, if they were in critical on the upper right or severe lower left groups. But in fact, if you did not need oxygen, then um, dexamethasone was no benefit to you. So now in the next slide, uh, here is just showing that depending on what level of disease you have, mild, moderate, uh, severe, or critical, these drugs, this one here, dexamethasone, had different effects. So if you had severe or critical disease, dexamethasone made you better. If you didn't have severe disease, dexamethasone might even have made you worse. Next slide. So 
these are the demonstrated treatments. We have a demonstrated antiviral and a demonstrated immunomodulator. They both seem to act at slightly different but overlapping parts of the sort of pyramid of COVID. Next slide. So now where, what's coming? What's coming are these things that are called ACT, the Adaptive COVID-19 Treatment Trials. And ACT-1 was the trial that gave us remdesivir uh, and showed its activity. Now they've taken remdesivir and they're trying it with or without another immunomodulator called baricitinib, which um, blocks uh, uh, immune response directly. And then the next trial that just started up uh, this coming week uh, that will start up this coming week is remdesivir with or without interferon to see if we can't boost the immune system early in the course of disease. Next slide. So I've tried to summarize um, some of the different aspects here and show you that antivirals are likely to be very important in people who have mild to moderate disease Whereas immunomodulators, once the virus has gotten uh, the immune system kicked off into too high a gear, immunomodulators will likely be important there in the critical and severe phases of disease. Last slide. So in summary, there are several themes that are important to keep in mind here. You've got to worry about the virus, the host, age, sex, and immune response. Well, sadly enough, the only things we can target are the virus and the immune response. So we've got drugs to treat the virus, we've got drugs to treat the immune response, and we've got new things coming. There's an enormous amount of work going on in this. And these multiple approaches, including many of the things you're gonna hear about today, including uh, plasma infusions and so on, these approaches are going to need to be understood in these prospective trials so we know exactly what to do and when. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Dr. Holland? Could be from the panel. Who I have a question. I have a question for Dr. Holland. Um, what about reinfections? Can you get COVID-19 again? This is a critically important question to which we do not yet have a definitive answer. It is certainly true that with the other coronaviruses, what we call the seasonal coronaviruses, people definitely get infected multiple times. Right now, it's not clear. If you look at somebody who got infected and then felt better, and then you know a month later felt sick again and tested positive, does that mean that they got reinfected? Or does it mean that their infection never fully went away, but it's been hovering around the level of detection? Right now, that is not yet resolved. We know that there are some people who have immune dysfunction who can stay infected for a long, long time. And we know that it is theoretically possible to get reinfected. I understand this has big implications for what we think vaccines are going to do. And these are going to be some of the critical issues we have to resolve over the next several months. Thank you very much. I think in the interest of letting everybody have a chance to say things, we'll move on. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. The next um, speaker is Charlotte Cunningham Rundles, who's at Mount Sinai in New York, which within New York was probably the epicenter of the New York epicenter and the COVID infections. And Charlotte's a world expert in immunodeficiency and will tell us about how that's affected her patients. Um, Charlotte? There, I think I've unmuted now. I have, a, I have a number of more or less anecdotal comments to make that really summarizes the position in New York. You I mean in the beginning in February and in March, I think everyone was thinking that we will actually be cascaded with sick patients. And the honest truth is that's not exactly what's happened. I myself write orders for immune deficient patients for immunoglobulin infusions uh, for about 300 patients. In addition to that, I see another several hundred patients with other versions of immune deficiency 
And in the beginning, I was completely puzzled as to why we weren't seeing many, many, many more cases than we did. I will tell you in a moment about those that we have seen. But first of all, the numbers are not really overwhelming. Out of that 400 or so patients, if you think about who we actually have seen who have been ill, it numbers are somewhere um, on the order of 15 or 16. So 15 or 16 was first of all very puzzling to me because the numbers remained small and we had rather few patients in the hospital. So my first thought was maybe the IVIG contains some beneficial gamma globulin that would actually contain some anti-neutralizing or other anti-spike COVID protein or antibody. And the answer to that was examined back in March and it came out in Nature Medicine. We tested 23 different lots of IVIG. Um, I think of three different products that we had a our handle on and 23 different uh, versions of that. And we found using an FDA approved test that was developed at Mount Sinai, that there was no cross-reactive antibody and absolutely no neutralizing antibody found in commercial gamma globulin. And so that didn't supply the answer to me as to why the patients were doing relatively well in terms of infections. So that was my first thought, but it didn't pan out. I mean, I must assume that our patients were just being very good and behaving and staying home, which I'm surely, I'm, I'm certain that's true. But you might wonder amongst the 15 who have done poorly. And in a way, it's funny that it parallels exactly what Dr. Holland was saying a moment ago, because we did have five deaths amongst this patient group. And amongst that group, who were those individuals? Um, they were more on the older side, over the age of 70, number one. Number two, diabetic, hypertensive, and or had already been on other additional immunosuppressants in their life, or even more recently, for example, for those patients with the very, very severe thrombocytopenia, one or two patients had been given recent um, immunosuppression for that. Uh, we have one younger patient who did not survive, who's 35 years old, extremely immune deficient, but she'd also had a kidney transplant when she was 16, and then she had lymphoma in her 30s. And so she's a patient that has additional issues to contend with. Amongst the older, we also had one patient who had a very high, um, I would say, weight. She's four feet nine and weighed 300 pounds, and so you must put her into the classification of really having a high BMI which we know, again, for reasons that we don't understand, is another one of those issues. And so we haven't been cascaded with difficulties, but as I say, we have had some deaths, which is very dismaying, but we've also had a number of patients get admitted to the hospital, and three I learned this week actually had this virus infection. I didn't realize it. I only knew it when I then called them back for the return appointment, and then they have gotten over it. Now, curiously, in some cases, some of these patients who are actually immune deficient actually tested positive for the COVID antibody. And since IVIG is not contaminating my view as to whether they made it or not, the answer is they actually did produce some antibody to this virus, which I think makes one feel happy about that. We've been using, and in five of my patients, we've admitted to the hospital and given them convalescent plasma. We have a very big convalescent plasma program at Mount Sinai. That includes three patients with X-linked agamma globulinemia who can make no antibody at all of their own. So in a way, it was very interesting because they had extremely prolonged course of hypogamma globulinemia up to three to four weeks. And then after having been admitted to the hospital, proven to have it, we obtained the inflammatory markers, gave them the convalescent plasma, and then they were discharged within three days with diminished inflammatory markers. So to me, it really proves the case that antibodies actually play a very interesting and useful role here. I think that was one of the clearest demonstrations that I can think about. So that article is in press actually now. Now, in terms of my experience, the other side of the coin is the International Union of Immunological Sciences has gathered together now 100 cases of various immune deficiencies in order to come up with some view about well, who is most at risk. Is it people who have problems making antibody? 
Is it those who have cellular difficulties? Is it those who have problems with their white cells? Otherwise, what is the risk issue here? What can these normal, what, what can primary immune deficiency tell us about the real issues? And it was curious to me because it took almost three months to gather 100 patients. And this is from all the medical centers that were participating across the United States, Europe, Asia, and Australia. So it took a, took a lot of time to get those 100 cases together. And that's been now submitted for publication as well. Again, to come up with some view about how people do well and how do people do poorly. Now of those 100 cases, 13 are from Mount Sinai. So I have to tell you, we, a little, we really a bit overweighed that ourselves. Um, my colleague, just for your interest, also did a study on somewhere around 90 patients with HIV infection and found that even HIV infection does not particularly overweigh. And in fact, those patients with HIV infection actually did not have a worse course. So I thought that was, again, another very interesting piece of information. Other things that might be pertinent is only one other thing to mention, which is that I'm the infusion director of the Biologics Infusion Center, where we have 2,000 patients who get infusions of biologics for their autoimmune diseases. So that's a number of different things. That would be rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and multiple sclerosis. And amongst that group of 2,000 patients that come into the infusion center, we've now had I think it's the number of finally is 40 cases. So 40 out of 2,000 people with Crohn's disease, people on all these immunomodulators, again, those numbers seem small to me. Again, perhaps we say that everyone is doing so well and they're staying home and they're in their masks. But again, the numbers are actually relatively small considering the amount of immunopression we are actually using. So I think th those are the anecdotal things. Some of them we've managed to write down. Others of those, you know, are coming with other authors as well. Um, and, and of course, we need to know so much more about how long do antibodies last? We don't know. Um, we actually are not, uh, not, not clear whether antibodies will be made and then sustained. I was interested in a um, article in the Wall Street Journal which uh, was written by one of our colleagues at UCLA who said, why are we running down on antibodies so badly? Of course, I love antibodies as everyone here probably knows. I think antibodies are terrific. Um, so why are we running them down? Why do we think antibody won't persist? And the honest truth is, you know, we don't know yet, it's true, but I was impressed by the use of the antibodies in the convalescent plasma program. I have been relatively impressed by that data. And again, that will be much more coming from various protocols across the United States on that particular topic. So thanks very much. And I hope these are pertinent to your discussions today. Thank you, Dr. Cunningham Rundles. Um, you know, Dr. Holland mentioned in his presentation uh, that immunosuppressed patients might have a, a more difficult time clearing the virus. So even though you're not seeing that many patients with COVID-19 or not, uh, not quite as such severe disease, um, does it seem to be lingering longer than in the general population? I, I really can't give you a really good answer on that because we all know uh, Perhaps, perhaps other individuals that are very prolonged. My, my own suspicion about the situation and the X-linked the gamma globulinemia was exactly that. It was written in the uh, in a journal that those patients do well, and they were wondering why. But I do point out that my patients with that particular form of immune deficiency and a few with other mutations actually did have a very prolonged course, several weeks, up to you know four weeks worth of infection and fever. Uh, we admitted one uh, fellow last week who has hyper IgM syndrome, an entirely different situation. And to our surprise, he has IgM anti COVID, but no IgG anti COVID, but he's now been sick close to a month with a very different presentation, by the way, than the others, with in his case extremely severe mouth ulcers and lots and lots of fever, but not much in terms of a chest x ray. So it could be the manifestations look different too. I can't swear that's not the case. It might not look the same in everyone. Charlotte, 
<clears throat> I gathered when you talked about the 100 patients and that you had the 13 of them, that yeah. you didn't come to a really clear conclusion about which type of immunodeficiency predisposed to, to COVID or changed the courses? Or was there a take home message that you thought about? Um, that's, 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 a, that's an extremely tough question. And I think the jury is out on that because basically antibody deficiencies are more common than the other defects. So in a way they outweighed the others. But one of the children that we did report and was included and will be included is a infant who came into um, um, observation really only because he had fever and he turns out to have a mutation in interferon receptor. And he was doing poorly, but not so very badly. Um, last week, a patient of mine with a mutation in a STAT3 gene has gotten almost nothing. He's a little bit feverish, but then you think, oh, well, not that bad. Now, it could be that some forms of immune deficiency really cut down the inflammatory side of things. And so perhaps, you know, one could speculate that some types of immune deficiency might give you a milder case. I don't know. I'd love to know what Steve thinks about that. Charlotte, can I ask a question? It's Howard Liebman. Yeah. Um, you know, many of the severe aspects of the disease really are reflective of more of the innate immune response. And as um, Cornell know, knows uh, from Jeff Lawrence, I mean, who's looked at complement issues, the microvascular thrombosis fits very nicely into the TMA, thrombotic microangiopathy of complement activation. So is it possible that in fact, really the more severe aspects are gonna to relate to, as you actually just suggested, the balance of the innate response to the virus more than actually the later responses, the, the acquired immune response of antibodies and cellular immunity? I mean, that, that, I think we end up having to think that's part of it. It's what happens early and what happens late. I suppose that you can swiftly make an antibody, perhaps that's going to attenuate it. I think that's why the XLAs had a worse time. But remember that they also have a gene mutation, which might mean that their macrophages and monocytes are already a little bit calmed down. It can't work all that well. And so perhaps then you miss some of the anti-inflammatory side. On the other hand, you don't get rid of the virus either, which may make it prolonged. I think this is one of those things that gathering the first hundred cases is wonderful, but to be honest with you, we need to gather two or three more hundred, I think, to really have a better idea about that. Well, I would just add, I think what Charlotte points out is critically important. We're gonna have to, we're gonna have to pull the pieces apart here to figure it out. There will be the early responses, uh, probably uh, antibody and T cell mediated in which antibody generation will be important. Those will be a lot about how do we control virus replication early. And then there'll be the late things, which may turn out to perversely be more of innate immune response once viral load achieves a certain level. And how do we keep load down, keep response low? And these are gonna be very, very difficult. And I think that's why it's important we think in terms of how do we handle the virus early? And then how do we handle uh, inflammation late? And it's gonna be putting those things together like we do for tuberculosis or many other diseases that I think will make the, the real difference in, uh, in getting this solved. Although, Steve, this is Howard Lehman again. There's suggestion in Jeff Lawrence data that it actually may be the lectin pathway that's activated for complement. And then the minute you start activating complement, you generate C3B, that brings in neutrophils. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and then when you go to C5A, it's a very potent activator of, of thrombin uh, generation. I mean, that was shown in, in, in Eileen White's is my wife's study on PNH. You shut down C5 activation and PNH, you shut down thrombosis. I, so I completely think it's, agree. it's oh, a very right. complex disease. Let's put it's it that a, way. It's a late feature of the disease. We see that in the people with very severe disease, which would be the people that are really um, switched on with a lot of inflammation whereas the vast majority never get to that uh, point, which is a good thing. Yeah. Thank, thank you um, very much. Thank you, Charlotte. And um, Bruce Sachet will tell us now about convalescent <laughs> plasma and what we've learned from that, because in addition to remdesivir and dexamethasone, that's another 
treatment that might and it seems to be turning out as Charlotte described to be very useful, at least in some settings and is being further explored. Bruce? Well, thanks a lot, Jim. Thanks for the opportunity to come and, and speak to you about convalescent plasma today. And I wanted to first start by making sure we're all on the same page on what we mean when we say convalescent plasma. So in a very general sense, convalescent plasma is taking the plasma, which is the liquid part of your blood from a patient who's recovered from a disease where antibodies would have been generated and giving it to somebody who's currently fighting that disease. And we know from the past that this has been used in other infections. We call this passive immunity because we're passing the immuno immunology or the, the antibodies from one patient to a, another, the recovered patient to the sick patient. Uh, and we know that this can help clear the virus for some infections in the short term. And we know that in some cases it can clear the symptoms faster in some patients. And so there were a few reports early on from China that suggested that in fact, convalescent plasma could do this for, uh, for COVID-19 disease. And based on that, in early March even, uh, the New York Blood Center, along with some of the hospitals, including Mount Sinai that you heard is very active, started to have conversations about if this was something that we wanted to try here in New York. And other parts of the country were also interested in this. And so we set out to be able to identify appropriate donors and collect plasma from uh, those donors to be able to make them available to patients. Importantly, even though we have a decent amount of data now, we don't have definitive data on effectiveness, and I'll talk about what we do have in a moment, but all of these uh, administrations of this plasma is all done under IND, so all done under the auspices of a research study where data are collected and patients are identified based on criteria, whether they fit or not. And most of this has been done in patients who are, who are, who are severe or on critical. So hospitalized patients that are <clears throat> about to have or starting to have some breathing problems or people with more severe breathing problems that need ICU and respiratory support type care. Um, there's a whole nother possible use we can mention briefly about, about protective early on and we have less data for that. So a big part of what we had to do with ourselves at the blood center, as well as with the FDA uh, in Washington is to identify what patients we could collect. And essentially what we know we needed to have is we had to have patients who clearly had COVID-19, which was challenging to diagnose early on because of the limited tested, testing that was available. This is again, back in March into early April. And <clears throat> somebody who'd resolved their symptoms for long enough that they wouldn't be infectious and they would be well enough to donate and long enough that they would have made the antibody response. So initially, without going into all the details, we, we set up criteria and people had to have been well for 28 days. And, and as we learned more uh, under certain conditions, we can collect people who have been well from the disease completely recovered for as little as 14 days. And that's what we're doing now because we understand that the antibodies in almost all of those patients are high enough to be of therapeutic value, at least potentially. And we also know that they're not infectious, so we're not gonna be passing along additional virus when we use the, the product, which is also very important. Another important thing that's changed since March is we have good antibody testing. And although there are issues with the test, depending on what you use, we are able to test the donors and test the products that we get out, the plasma units, before we distribute them out to hospitals so we can demonstrate that in fact, there are uh, appropriate amounts of antibody in the, the plasma. <clears throat> so those are all things that we were, were doing to be able to get this uh, together. Again, this is something that we can now give to hospitals under what's called an IND. So there's, uh, means that they have permission to study the use of the convalescent plasma in hospitalized patients. And um, a lot of that is done in, in what's called an expanded use access protocol uh, through the Mayo Clinic. And you have, or we'll, we'll probably hear a little bit more about that. But <clears throat> basically, it's a national study where hospitals can enroll their patients to be able to use the convalescent plasma. So in the beginning, we didn't really know if we had efficacy. We also didn't know if we had safety. So since that, so we moved fairly cautiously at first, but we really at the blood center scaled up our collections because we did anticipate one, that this could be safe and potentially effective, 
two, we knew that hospitals were, were desperate at the time for trying things. And so that if something were gonna be available quickly, this is something this passive immunity for convalescent plasma can be made available relatively quickly compared to some of the other medications you heard about. Um, and, and the initial reports we were getting were that, were that it was safe. So number one, we have to know that it's safe and then we have to understand if it's efficacious. So since the time that we started this, <clears throat> the study has been published up to 20,000 recipients of convalescent plasma and very few of those recipients, so less than 1% had any kind of significant reaction to the plasma. And the vast majority of those reactions are with the same reactions you would have to normal plasma. So when we give a plasma transfusion to a patient in a hospital, especially someone with lung disease, there are certain things we're careful about and expect that we might see that are, <clears throat> excuse me, adverse events. And the adverse events that we're seeing with the convalescent plasma are basically mirroring what we would see with any plasma. And that's really important because one of the things you heard about with the immune response is that it's very important in the disease itself to the virus. And it's possible that giving somebody a lot of antibody all at once to the virus could actually make the immune response worse and could make them sicker. And we are not seeing that here in the US and they've not seen that in other countries where convalescent plasma is used. So that's a really important point to understand. The second important point is now, is it effective? And we saw that for a couple of interventions now we have good data to say that, that they're effective in, in some of our COVID populations. And we're getting that now for convalescent plasma. So we're not quite as far along, but and what we have is a little more observational, but there are at least 12 studies now in the literature, mostly not very large, you know, dozens or scores of patients that uh, throughout the world that have looked at hospitalized patients that have got uh, the, the convalescent plasma. And it was recently actually just available uh, meta-analysis, which is an analysis of all of the studies together to try to put their data together to see if we can find any evidence that they're safe. So first, and we're really, I'm sorry, efficacious. So first to say that all of the studies, even though they were small, showed a trend toward faster viral clearance and a trend toward patients being in critical condition for less time, patients being in the hospital less, and maybe some signals on mortality, meaning less people, people die. So each individual study looked as if, looked promising in those respects. When you do a statistical analysis of all of them, according to this paper, which is available, but not yet peer reviewed scientifically, there's actually a statistically significant reduction in mortality, so less death, uh, and that reduction is 57%, where we talk about the odds of death in the patients who were hospitalized and severe or critical in the hospital uh, of about 0.43. So cutting the death rate about in half when you look across all the studies. So this is not definitive. It's not as good as having one large randomized controlled trial, but it's very encouraging that we're not seeing adverse events that we don't expect and we're not seeing, and we are, we are seeing improvements in, in some of these parameters such as mortality. Um, it was also, um, when we look, they look just at, there were some randomized controlled trials that were small. And when they put them together and only those studies together, they saw the mortality. And if they, there's also something called the match study where you look at people who got the plasma and then you try to find patients that are similar that didn't get the plasma and compare those groups. And if they looked at those studies independently, they also saw a decrease in the mortality. So we do have uh, some efficacy data that's really coming out now to show us that uh, we are, do in fact appear to be helping patients. So again, early on when we started this, we had very little such data and we had a lot of anecdotal reports because we heard from, from, from Dr. Cunningham that people who were using it saw cases where it really, you couldn't imagine how it didn't help because of the timing. And now we're starting to get uh, more systematic data that supports the use of convalescent plasma, at least for patients who are hospitalized and severe, meaning they're having breathing problems, but they're not quite to the point of being on a respirator or they're just early on a respirator. Some of the studies have broken out the severe um, um, to, to the extremely sick and the critical patients. And it looks like the critical patients don't do as well with the convalescent plasma. And that's probably as, as you've heard us allude to, 
that the immune system takes over and its response is probably more important at that point than the presence of the virus itself. And what we expect the antibodies to do is to help clear the virus. So it looks like there's a sweet spot in the middle where the convalescent plasma has a, a larger effect. One thing we don't know, but it's an area of investigation very actively across the country now is can it protect people from getting sick who are at risk or if you get it really early on and you're not in the hospital yet, will it help you from getting to the hospital? And so the, the expectation is that it should have, if it's working the way we think it is, it should have effects there, but we don't know yet. So those, are, those questions are being asked actively uh, throughout the country and actually throughout the world. So I'll, I'll guess I'll stop here if there are questions because I don't want to go too, too long. Thank you very much, Bruce. And uh, I apologize, I didn't introduce you as being at the New York Blood Center and having earned your spurs at the University of Pennsylvania, one of my favorite places. That's Caroline, do you have a question? Uh, we're actually getting questions from patients and caregivers on our Facebook page who are watching this program live right now. So someone has a question about uh, convalescent plasma. If immunity is dropping in patients after a few weeks, how does this affect therapeutic value of plasma? Is there a time window to collect it? Um, and then how does that relate to IVIG or gamma globulin? Okay, so, so several questions. So the first question is, is easier to address. And that is the answer is yes, there is a time window as you've heard, we don't know exactly what it is. So we do several things to make sure that our plasma has antibodies in it. One, we collect from donors, as I described, that have certain timing from when they got well. And we act, I didn't say that there's an end point, but we actually, three months afterwards, we're not collecting now. Uh, although that may change based on data we're, we're gonna analyze internally soon. And that's because we're worried that the antibody levels could go down. The other thing we do is we're testing the units that are collected. And so if they fall below a certain threshold and start testing negative in, in the tests that we're using, and we're using several in our strategy, then we would not release that unit, even though we collected it from someone and said, oh, this is gonna be convalescent plasma for COVID. If it comes back with a negative test, we don't use it for that. And then we stop collecting that donor moving forward. So we have two ways that we're addressing that now. And then the third thing we're doing is we're analyzing some of our repeat donors now for antibody levels to see if we could demonstrate that the antibodies last longer and we can actually extend out longer. But at the moment, we do have limits and we do test. Could you comment on IVIG? As sure. I understand it, the, through the NIH, there's going to be a hyperimmune IVIG study that's building on the success of what you talked about with the convalescent plasma to see if we could have hyperimmune products that would be good for the virus. Right, so there are definitely those efforts underway. So just like IVIG is made from normal healthy people, you can make special IVIG essentially that concentrates the antibody from, from recovered COVID patients. And that is also being done. There's a group of plasma fractionators that have come together to work together to make this product. And I believe the tests are either just opened or they will just start soon uh, be evaluating that. The there are some advantages to that over the bags of plasma. One is that you would have thousands of vials of antibody or bottles of antibody that would be the same. So you would know what's already in there. Whereas even though we're testing our antibody, our plasma, we know there's a minimum level of antibody, but some may have twice as much as other, and we'd like that to be more consistent. The other is for the, for the physicians and the patients, it's easier to manage uh, inventory and administration of something that comes like that in, in the concentrated form. So those are definitely products that are, that are being worked on and are coming down the pike. As far as the general IVIG, I'm not surprised that there were no antibodies to COVID found because I think the lag time from collection is something like six months to production. So if you getting IVIG that comes out of the factory today, the plasma was probably collected three, six, nine months ago. So in the future, as more and more people have antibodies, it's possible that there could be COVID antibodies in those. But I think the people who make the IVIG will probably be shifting donors as much as they can to make the specific product, Jim, that you just mentioned. So 
the implication of what you just said, which I think is likely to be correct, is that there won't be much anti-COVID antibody and IVIG for a while. Even the IVIG being made now will probably have very little of it in it, if any. Correct. Okay. Um, can yeah, I ask one last question? I don't know if Dr. Hall is still on, but has there been efforts to develop recombinant monoclonal antibodies that selectively bind to uh, COVID uh, spike proteins that would inhibit uh, infection? Mm -hmm. Yes, I have seen people publishing on monoclonal antibodies that have been created and they could be used on their own or possibly as a way to spike hyperimmune and CIRA to enhance its efficacy. And again, for consistency uh, across those preparations. So it's being looked at both independently, I think, and uh, in combination with the hyperimmune. Because we really don't know what the most important antibodies are yet. Probably a combination product would be the ideal uh, to, to focus on right now. Thank you very much, Bruce. That was great. My pleasure. Um, Christy Marks, who's an associate professor of infectious disease at Weill Cornell, is a principal investigator in, I believe, one of the vaccine studies. And she'll tell us about vaccines, how to assess them, and where we are. Christy? Excellent. Thank you. Um, so yes, I'm going to share some work being done through the COVID Prevention Network, which you may have heard about um, on the news is a, uh, a research network that's using existing research sites throughout the United States and throughout the rest of the world um, that have done prevention work and other diseases uh, to look at the vaccines for COVID. We're actually also going to be looking at some of the monoclonal antibodies as well. And there will be um, studies of those in um, large nursing home uh, sites, for instance, as a prevention when there's a known outbreak. So the answer to kind of that last question. Um, so I'm going to focus today on the vaccine. Um, so I am uh, leading this study at the Cornell site. I'm not leading the, uh, in it, the entire um, vaccine study that I'm going to talk about. But first, I'm just going to speak generally about vaccines. So if you can go to the next slide. So we've heard about this spike protein today. And it, um, the spike protein you can see on the image on the left is part of what gives coronavirus its name. So under the microscope, coronavirus looks like it has a crown around it with these little uh, um, spikes coming out of it. And those are the target for uh, most of the vaccines that are in development. Slide. Um, so why, why do we need a vaccine? So obviously there's benefit to individuals in terms of what we would hope is that a vaccine can help prevent acquiring the infection at all. And if you are do acquire it to help reduce getting sick. So preventing the virus from getting down into the lungs and causing the pneumonia or preventing some of these other immune responses that can be so detrimental to people. Also, it can benefit the community because uh, it will reduce transmission from person to person and would keep communities healthier in general that, you know, if you were then exposed at work, say a, a frontline worker like this shown in the pictures, you, know, you wouldn't have to quarantine for 14 days after a known exposure because you would know you have protection. That's what we do with other viral infections. Next slide. So how do vaccines work? Um, so they use proteins from the virus and use those to trigger the person's immune response to send out a signal that then when we actually see the virus, we will recognize it and the immune system can take care of it. And like I said, prevent it either from causing infection at all, or at least prevent it from causing a severe infection. One very important thing is that these viruses do not cause COVID illness. The vaccines are being tested are, are synthetic or laboratory made for the most part, and they're using pieces of the virus, not the whole virus. So vaccines do not cause infection. And I also wanna point out that no one in a vaccine study will be exposed to the virus to see if it works um, intentionally. There's no, these studies are being conducted in large populations. 
um, but no one will be intentionally exposed to virus to see if it works. So vaccines themselves do not cause the illness. They, they cause an immune response to the virus. Next slide. So what uh, I want to talk a little bit more just about how it would work. So there's this is a kind of very blown up picture of that virus I showed you before. So on the far left is the coronavirus um, with that projection coming out of it, which is the spiked protein. So this is enlarged, uh, you know, with an electron microscope or it's a picture um, replicating that. And then on the right side is the human cell, which has, you may have heard about this ACE2 receptor. Um, so we want to interrupt the spike protein from binding that, from connecting to that ACE2 receptor to try to prevent infection of the human cells. Next slide. So the vaccine will help generate, um, and that's showing that connection being made. Next slide. So the, va the um, vaccine in response to giving a vaccine or also in response to giving convalescent plasma or the monoclonal antibodies, the presence of antibodies, which I think it got a little cut off, there should be an S there, um, which are the purple and green little Y-shaped things can help prevent uh, the spike protein from actually binding that receptor. So it, it surrounds the spike protein and then the virus doesn't have an opportunity to get into the cell. And moreover, part of that why that's attached to it can trigger immune cells to then dispose of the virus and get rid of it. So that, that's how the antibodies work. Next slide. So you probably heard a lot about, you know, we want a vaccine rapidly. Um, but I want to make it very clear that the steps that we use to test vaccines are all still happening. No steps are being skipped. So the first thing is after people have an idea to make a vaccine, uh, it's tested in animals and then there's human studies. All of these steps are happening. Next slide. So we actually do a series of different types of studies um, which are known as phases. So the phase one is the first study that helps kind of figure out if the uh, vaccine is safe and if it has any potential for triggering an immune response. The phase two um, helps with that same thing as well as finding the right dose. And then the phase three of the study is the one where we see if it actually works in a large number of people. And also find out more subtleties about safety. So in general, these studies take place in sequential order and one starts after the other. Um, and because of you know, the need for a vaccine to be developed more rapidly, what's happening is the, the studies are overlapping. So we get the initial information we need from the phase one and start the phase two. And then uh, once the initial information from the phase two is available, then we start the phase three. People will be continue to be followed for years um, as part of these studies, but it, this overlap is what's allowing us to get a vaccine faster. So I just want to re-emphasize, no safety steps are being skipped. Um, in fact, I, the vaccines are very, very diligent with uh, weekly phone calls in these studies to find out how people are doing and to make sure we know everything as well as diaries that people keep themselves about every potential side effect. Next slide. So what are the main questions for the phase three study? So, like I said, is the study safe to give to people? And can the study vaccine reduce the severity of COVID illness? Next slide. So I wanna tell you kind of a little more about one vaccine to kind of illustrate how all of this happens. So um, you may have heard of mRNA vaccines on television and mRNA is one way of delivering uh, uh, the spike protein of the coronavirus into humans so that the immune system can react to it. So, um, this has been done in different ways. Um, and there's several vaccines that will deliver the spike protein in different strategies. Some will just inject the spike protein directly, some with a kind of adjuvant to help stimulate the immune system. Some use a viral vector to get it in of a, a virus that's not capable of reproducing itself in humans. And this is a newer strategy that's giving, putting in a little piece of RNA that um, is what our body uses to make 
proteins and injecting it directly into muscle cells so that the host, the person cells can make the protein themselves and then the immune system responds to it. So I think of it sort of as a like um, coded message that is put into the cells or a recipe that can then, then be used to make uh, a bunch of the protein, which then can be recognized by the immune system. And this is just naturally degrades over a few days so that it's not present in the body forever. It does not become part of the human cells. It is um, disposed of the way uh, our body disposes of, our, of mRNA that we use for other reasons. So, um, so again, no, uh, it's a man-made thing. There's no part of the virus or no live virus that's being used. So this study, this um, vaccine, the mRNA, 1273 is one of the ones that will be the first vaccine studies to be conducted in the United States. So the phase one and phase two studies have already enrolled and we found out some safety information from those, um, including that, um, and also some, some information that's crucial to understanding how well it works. So I mentioned those, we wanna show that it can make those antibodies and very importantly are ones that are called neutralizing antibodies, ones that really neutralize the virus, not just bind to it, ones that we know will actually neutralize it. So it, it was found that it takes two doses of this vaccine to create um, uh, the amount of those antibodies that would be desirable um, in a person. And then um, it was also seen that people um, after the first shot tolerate it very well. And after the second shot may have some side effects like fever, headache, body aches, things that can be seen with um, vaccines similar to what people might experience with the, when they get the influenza vaccine. So sort of, we call it, you know, sort of reacting to the vaccine itself. Again, not, not a infection at all, but your immune system kind of telling you it sees that protein and it's um, creating a response to it. Um, so um, I actually think it may be hard in this phase three study, which is planned, uh, and we'll have a placebo and a vaccine and, and people, you know, I won't know which one uh, participants get, they won't know, but I do think some of these reactions may give us a little clue. But um, so I think it may be hard to keep this study unblinded because I think people uh, after the second shot at least might have a suspicion if they, if they had the vaccine or not. Um, so the um, the other thing I wanted to mention is the animal studies. So the animal studies are very important for the vaccine development because those, in, in contrast to humans, where I said we will not expose anyone to coronavirus, you can expose animals to coronavirus to see how well it worked. And so for this vaccine, that was done in non-human primates. And um, it was very encouraging that um, not only did these non-human primates make these antibodies that we were looking for, but that they, it also prevented the infection from um, taking off in the lungs and even prevented carriage for more than a couple of days in the nasal passages. So it looks like it um, in non-human primates did what it would be intended to do, which would be um, prevent pneumonia and prevent you know, the complications of the virus and also um, hopefully prevent people from carrying it in their nose and preventing spread. So that was the good news on the non-human primates. So, that I think is sort of an example of one of the vaccines coming there. That will be the first um, phase three study being done in the United States. There's other ones planned through the prevention network and then also some planned through industry. Thank you very much, Christy. Could you, could you comment a little on how the scale up is happening? At least if you listen on TV to the CEOs or the PR releases, it sounds like even though they're not sure what's going to, what, how well it'll work or that'll really be good, they're already manufacturing very many doses to try to be ready when and if. Right. So there, you know, there's, I think this is where some of the government funding comes in as well as to uh, allow this to be possible so that as soon as we know it's effective um, and safe that, uh, it will be available, not to have to wait, you know, two years for it to be produced. And that's also why some strategies may be um, more ideal than others. For instance, the mRNA can be scaled up very quickly. Um, 
So I think um, it's, you know, similarly to how the phase one, two, and three studies are overlapping, the production isn't waiting to find out that the vaccine actually works or is FDA approved. But obviously those, you know, if it doesn't work or is unsafe, those will just be destroyed. Those, uh, Next, we have a we have a question uh, from one of our Facebook viewers from Nicole. Um, she writes, "I understand that the vaccine causes an immune response. My question is, what if you have an autoimmune disease as ITP, and your immune system does not generate antibodies? What are the consequences when that happens? Can you get ill because of the response of your autoimmune system? And what would the side effects then be?" Right. So one, I am, I'm going to take kind of a slightly different angle. One thing I think people were worried about with um, vaccine or antibody strategies is could you actually make COVID illness worse? Um, and if you, you know, have antibodies and then get exposed to coronavirus, um, or um, if you have uh, other immune parts of your immune system that can react to the coronavirus because they've been exposed to the uh, vaccine, you know, could the, could the um, inflammation from the infection actually be worse? And there's been no evidence of that in these early phase studies or in um, animal models. So that's very encouraging that it doesn't seem like the vaccine would make COVID worse. Um, in terms of can vaccines trigger autoimmune diseases, I think I'm going to defer to the other experts on the panel. You know, I think this vaccine works very similarly to other vaccines in terms of how it creates an immune response. So um, I will defer to others there. Howard, do you want to comment? Well, I think, um, I, I think, you know, when we talk about obviously vaccines and, um, and ITP in specifics, Obviously, there are many cases, particularly in the pediatric population that develop after, and you're the expert on that, develop after a prior viral infection. It's less clear in adults, though, that in fact, a viral infection leads to ITP. And I think that's one thing. The second issue is patients always ask me, do, do, if I get an infection or if I get, a, get the flu shot, will my ITP get worse? I have not experienced in our large cohort of patients, we make sure every one of our patients gets the influenza uh, vaccinations that we have not seen a relapse in our experience, although it's been described after getting their flu shots. So I think on overall, I think probably the risk of COVID in my mind, uh, without the risk of the outcome of COVID in a patient, uh, an adult, would outweigh any issues of reactivating ITP in a patient who got the vaccination. Also, I think the mRNA is different because you're not getting the, the actual combination of the protein itself and, and occasionally in the more acute response to the protein, you're generating the protein at a rate that would depend on the amount of mRNA that goes before. So I think probably, the, as she mentioned, the initial reaction to the first injection was relatively mild. And I think that's very interesting because many of us can describe significant reactions to vaccinations on the first injection. And so I think that suggests that that's gonna not be as significant an issue in reactivating someone's ITP as it would be um, in some of our standard immunizations. Ming, what do you say, Jim? Well, I was gonna ask Ming if in China, he holds vaccines or how he thinks vaccines might or might not activate ITP? Uh, in my opinion, I think uh, uh, since COVID-19 uh, seems to not affect platelet count so much, so I don't think the vaccination will uh, reactive with ITP. That's my opinion. Okay. Well, I, I think, Howard, you summarized it nicely. <clears throat> There's individual cases where the vaccine can worsen ITP, but fortunately, they're not very common. And I think like for certain diseases in kids, like chicken pox or measles, the risk of the disease far outweighs the risk of a small chance that your ITP would get a little worse. <clears throat> 
So I think like you and Christy said, it makes sense to go ahead and protect yourself, especially from a disease like this. Yeah. Um, so for anybody who wasn't here at the start, um, we're going to go more now into ITP specifically um, with the exception that Howard is going to, Liebman is going to tell us about how the thrombotic tendency happens with the virus. Then we're going to go to Nikki Cooper, who's the PI of an interesting study for COVID in general, aside from having a lot of experience with COVID and ITP patients, and then wrap it up with Ming Hu and I talking a little about our experience and then hopefully having enough time for questions and answers. Howard, Howard is a professor. Are you, are you the Jane Ann Knoll professor? No, and I'm the Donald I. Feinstein professor. <laughs> even more honorable, given what a great uh, professor and teacher and clinician Donald Feinstein was. Howard's the at USC and is one of the country's leaders, world leaders in thrombosis, and has been doing some research on the way that COVID seems to cause a thrombotic tendency. Howard? Well, thank you, Tim. Um, I think we need to take a little time just to go over the issue about what and how people think about thrombosis. When you think about thrombosis, most people think about a blood clot in a leg or the story of the aunt who got a blood clot that went to her lungs, that's called a pulmonary embolism. But in reality, thrombosis is basically the exaggeration of the normal, what I would call response to an injury. Um, and, um, and so what I'm saying is that we're always clotting. If you don't actually have a normal hemostatic or clotting system, as people think about it, Example, in people who have hemophilia who are missing one of the essential proteins necessary for the formation of clot, literally in the first year of life, those children develop bleeding into their joints. So we're always dealing with the stress on our blood vessels. In reality, there are really kind of two forms of clotting. One is what we call is arterial thrombosis. And that's involving the vessels that take blood from the heart out to the peripheries, even to the smallest vessels in the heart. Those are called arteries and then microvascular uh, issues where there are small vessels that literally allow only a single red cell to go through the, the uh, circulation and then they go back into the veins. In arterial thrombosis, the issue there is really disruption or abnormalities of the cells that line those arteries, which are called endothelial cells. The classic example is living on a McDonald's diet you're overweight, you have diabetes, you get what's called atherosclerosis. And that's damage of the arterial vasculature by the accumulation of fats and inflammation in cells. But the second aspect of this issue of um, what we would call arterial thrombosis is that the most important aspect of that is the platelet. And that's one of the reasons in, in managing ITP, many of us do not want to have patients, particularly older patients who are on example drugs such as thrombopot receptor agonists to have too high a platelet count. And many of the thrombotic events that have been reported with the thrombopot receptor agonists, drugs like uh, eltrombopag or avathrombopag or ronipacin, those drugs the arterial events seem to have a significant role, particularly in individuals whose platelet counts are too high or have risk factors for those kind of arterial events. And those arterial events are classically heart attacks and strokes. Now, the other clots that are important are the ones that occur in veins. And I mentioned in the lower extremities, but other veins that can happen in the arms. And the most significant are pulmonary embolisms, which usually are clots that have traveled uh, from larger vessels into the lungs. And those are really related to a variety of factors that enhance the overall coagulation system. And the most classic are many of the things we think about. We become more hypercoagulable as we get older. And so the risk of clotting rises with age. Now I'm mentioning these risk factors because you're gonna see they relate to many of the risk factors that result in bad outcomes 
with uh, COVID-19. The other aspect of it, which is important, is obesity. The rate of thrombosis hospitalizations in Americans doubled between 1990 and 2010. And the thing that correlated more closely with that is the number of Americans in that same period of time who had BMIs, basic metabolic indexes, of greater than 36, meaning more Americans are overweight and more Americans have BMIs greater than 40 and are morbidly obese. In men in particular, the accumulation of fat as you get heavier in the abdomen leads to something called the metabolic syndrome, which is also associated with increased risk of thrombosis because it enhances many of the inflammatory aspects of atherosclerosis, the thing that leads to heart attack and strokes, but also those same inflammatory responses raise aspects of our blood system that make us more susceptible to blood clots. So let's go on and talk about COVID. COVID is an inflammatory infection. There's no doubt about it. And the more severity of the disease relates to very high levels of inflammation, markers of inflammation that occur. Now, it's interesting that early in the disease, when patients were admitted with severe respiratory symptoms and hospitalized, physicians would require a, a number of tests, but one of the tests they would get was called D-dimers. Now, D-dimers are the classic tests that physicians use today to assess whether somebody who has symptoms, let's say of shortness of breath or other symptoms or leg swelling, whether they might have a clot that's responsible for these symptoms. And normally we're always generating a little bit of these D-dimers because we're making clots and they're a, a breakdown product of the activity of the enzyme that starts the clot called thrombin on the protein that helps make the clot called fibrinogen to make fibrin. And then a secondary response to that fibrin that does a little bit of its breaking down. So the higher the D-dimer are in the blood, the more likely we would think that someone might be generating a clot. Now, when we think about it for a normal individual, not COVID, a normal individual, example, we think about D-dimers greater than 500 nanograms per ml. That would suggest for anyone under the age of 50, there's a chance they have a clot. And, but because I mentioned the activation of client system rises with age, we calculate the risk based on age times 10. So if you're 70 years old, if you're greater than 700, we think they might have a clot. Well, what about the patients that come in with COVID infection, severe COVID infection? Here the levels are in the thousand range, three, four, 5,000. We've even seen patients that are beyond the limits of the assay, greater than 10,000 D-dimers. In those circumstances, physicians begin to think of an overwhelming activation of the client system, which is called disseminated intravascular coagulation. And that's a disease that can be associated with overwhelming infections, uh, massive metastatic cancer, uh, major trauma, et cetera, where there's a lot of the protein that activates the cloudy system called tissue factor that's released into the circulation. So why would it be that in those circumstances, what would you expect in somebody who has D-dimers of five or 10,000? Well, you're generating a lot of the enzyme based clots, so that's also activating platelets. So one of the other markers for disseminate intravascular clotting is low platelets. Yet, as mentioned previously um, by Dr. Howe, that in fact, reality is that the platelets are conserved despite these. The platelets are frequently in the normal range. And finally, the other factor is, is that if you're generating these, you have to be consuming a lot of the protein that is involved in the clot called fibrinogen. Yet, when they measure fibrinogen, it is usually normal, even sometimes on the high end of normal. So where is this clotting activity occurring? And we now know that a lot of it's occurring in the microvasculature. Here, there's not so much consumption because the actual overall amount of, of fiber deposition is quite small, yet it's going on in that circulation. So one is that microvascular thrombosis is a significant aspect of the disease, and particularly in the small vessels of the lungs. So it means that in the circumstances of the severe infection of COVID, 
there's involvement of the endothelium of the lungs leading to cl clotting in the small vessel lungs. This has been shown not only that, but some patients with COVID get skin lesions. And when they biopsy these skin lesions, they find again, clotting in the small vessels of the skin. So one of the aspects of, of the thrombosis as, as it's called with COVID is this small vessel thrombosis that contributes to the lung injury and other tissue injury, including even the heart. The other aspect is they do get these large clots. Now, patients who are at home for long periods of time in a study from Switzerland, up to seven to eight days, and then finally come to the hospital, those patients are more likely in the first week to have evidence of a large vessel thrombosis. So again, once symptoms begin to start and you activate the clotting system, the chances of large vessel thrombosis increases. And so in those early phases uh, in patients who are basically coming in the hospital because their disease has progressed, their symptoms have progressed at home, they will tend to have more likely pulmonary emboli and clots in the lower extremity. Then in the patients who are in the hospital who present early with symptoms, over time, you begin to see again an accumulation of clotting events later on. Now in the literature is very confused because it keeps growing. And now we don't have, we only see have small institution report. So the incidence of clotting, meaning the frequency in the patients who admitted COVID goes from in some reports zero to as high as 60 to 70%. Probably it's a good 25 to 50% of patients will develop symptomatic large vessel clots. But what about activation? When a patient comes into the hospital, we routinely place them on anti-clotting medicines called prophylactic doses of what's called low molecular HEP. There is data from China and some data suggesting from Italy that the use of low molecular heparins early on when patients are admitted with COVID may reduce the long-term mortality. But interestingly enough, it doesn't seem to necessarily reduce the risk of clotting because in French studies and other studies, again, from the study from Switzerland, as you look out over time, you're not necessarily protected from prophylactic doses. That has led to other people to suggest that maybe patients need higher doses. So many of the protocols begin that patients are initially started on prophylactic doses, but if their D-dimers, which are high, do not appear to be suppressed, they go to a higher dose, a half of treatment dose. Again, there's no good data yet to document that this is more efficacious than the remaining on the prophylactic dose and no evidence that in fact, in the long term, you're gonna reduce much of the morbidity or the mortality of the disease. So in summary, what I can say is that we know this is a risk factor. What is interesting now is that more and more patients with minimal symptoms are told to stay at home or come to the ER or screened for mild symptoms and sent home. There are now studies starting using the oral anticoagulants that once you're found to have symptoms and are told to go home and to be monitored at home for your symptoms, they are taking patients and randomizing them to either receive a Pixaban, which is Eliquist, at the preventive dose, prophylactic dose, or Xeralto at the preventive or prophylactic dose, and then being monitored by teleconference to symptoms and progression of the disease or symptoms that might be related to the development of blood clots. So I think we're gonna see potentially an effort to see if in fact, early use of anticoagulants at the more prophylactic and maybe somewhat safer dose of the oral anticoagulants can change the risks for patients early on who are sent home and monitored for progression of symptoms and the risk of clots. Whether that will be protective, I don't know. There's not a lot of good data about these drugs being protective for arterial clots, which I mentioned is associated predominantly with damage to the vessel linings, the endothelium, 
But again, there are more and more studies trying to find the best way to prevent these clots in the hospitalized patients, and now studies to try to prevent the clots and potentially reduce the progression of the disease in ambulatory patients with symptoms who are found to be positive in outpatient screening. So I'll leave it there and I'll see if there's any questions. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much, Howard. We have time for one question, Caroline. Yeah, so um, we know that patients who've had splenectomy to treat their ITP are at higher risk for thrombosis. So if a patient who's had a splenectomy were to uh, get uh, COVID, how could that potentially impact them? Well, I think th th there's two things there. One is that, you know, there's the acute risks during splenectomy, but now there's good data from the paper from Soames Boyle. I think that's what you're discussing from, from UC Davis that there's a long-term increased risk of thrombosis. But all patients with ITP are at increased risk of thrombosis. The earlier studies put it at about uh, 1.5 to 2.5 fold increased risk. More recent studies have put it at higher levels for venous clots, up as high as from the, um, the Scandinavian and French co combined cohort at about a six fold risk. So I say that yes, an ITP patient, and particularly even with post splenectomy, is going to have a high risk of thrombosis. And I think particularly if they're developing symptoms, they are, have a much more prominent inflammatory response. The issue is, I think that's important in regards to the issue. Would I recommend prophylaxis? If they had safe and adequate platelet counts, I would have no problem in recommending prophylaxis for the fear of someone who had their spleen out and now has now a at a normal platelet count because COVID itself seems to spare the platelet count and put them on low dose. Now I should mention though, that in at least one trial that looked at platelets, particularly in COVID, when the platelet count did begin to fall, prognosis got a lot worse and the outcome for the disease was much worse. And we don't know what contribution actually the activation of clotting related to that drop in platelet count. But if a patient has a good platelet count, I think they're reasonably safe to take um, a example, a low dose of Eliquis, assuming also they have good uh, liver and kidney function. So I think, you know, I, I, it is, I think these studies that are starting now will answer that question because there are more and more patients that are really sent home with mild symptoms and monitored home. And many times those symptoms will last a week or two. And, and, there, and we've actually seen uh, uh, these three patients not, not ITP patients, the three patients that we've consulted on who went home and developed thrombosis at home and came back to the hospital with pulmonary embolism and, and a previous COVID um, uh, documented infection. So again, I think you're at risk with an inflammatory disease at home if you're susceptible to thrombosis. Howard, thank you very much. Just for the sake of our patients, I would say that while most of us would agree there's an increased risk of clotting in ITP, the risk is small enough that it's been somewhat controversial, very hard to define, and maybe only slightly above normal. And I think some people believe that really it only occurs in the people who might have had clotting anyway. So I think there's no question you did a great description of COVID and the risk of clotting in that but I don't want the ITP patients on the symposium to think that all of a sudden there's a public health menace they weren't aware of. Well, when we talk about relative risk, we're talking about against the background and age match. But what, what's the risk nationally? The risk is, is nationally a function of age, gender, and other factors. And people know those other factors are important. Yep. Gender, age, obesity, all the fame factors talked about COVID. And that's why I think it's important, again, that we should always remember and tell our ITP patients about dealing with all the other aspects of health. So we're gonna hear now from the, one of the two worldwide leaders of ITP that we have on the conference. And I think of Nicola Cooper from Imperial and the Hammersmith in London as by far the leader in Europe for the study of pathogenesis and treatment of ITP. Nicola?
Thank you. Hi, Joan. Thank you for inviting me. I really enjoyed this session. So I guess the two things you asked me to talk about, and we have a short, short period of time, is first is ITP in the context of COVID. Um, and we have seen some ITP cases. We have seen some patients who have relapsed during the COVID period, but this has not been high numbers at all. So I think we can, ha I ha can count it in one hand, maybe four or five patients out of our cohort of about 500 patients. Um, we have had one patient who died, but he again was of the older cohort of patients. So he it fitted very much into the um, morbidity that we see with COVID. The other patients were easy to manage for their ITP. We have also seen a very small number of acute um, ITP episodes, which appear to be associated with COVID um, events. Some of them are PCR negative, but they have the inflammatory features such as raised D-dimers and raised ferritin that go as associated with this inflammatory condition we see with COVID that causes so much morbidity and mortality. Um, and I think it, it has been complicated to treat, but I think reassuringly, I think it's, it, it, the, this is small numbers. And I don't, I don't believe that we have seen anything that makes me think that people with ITP are more at risk of COVID or more at risk of that uh, morbidity and the problems, the consequences um, of COVID, I think. And Jim, is that sort of consistent with some of the things you, you've seen also in New York or, or um, Howard in LA? Yeah, I, I would say yes. Um, yeah. I was, I was going to spend a minute later just talking very briefly about some of the specifics of what we saw. I thought your experience was striking, I thought, for the fact that some of your patients had some bleeding. Certainly, we have seen more intracranial hemorrhages, small intracranial hemorrhages, nothing that has needed surgical intervention, nothing that has caused problems, but small bleeds in the brain that has been associated with the ITP associated with COVID. So it is different. It's very different from the standard kind of ITP. And I think that um, some of the features we've seen in COVID as well as anxiety and I don't think it's just related to COVID. I think we are beginning to understand some of the neurological complications um, of COVID. So that's certainly, I think, what we have seen. Again, they are small numbers, but it's definitely a different, it, this six months has been different from us to our, my usual kind of six months. So we've definitely had a higher incidence of numbers of patients we've had to treat, higher numbers of patients we've had to bring into hospital as well. Um, and then I guess, so Jim, you also wanted me to talk about the studies that we've been involved in. So early on in the COVID pro process, we've been involved, it, it became very clear that there is an inflammatory nature to this and that for some of the COVID mortality is to, to do with inflammation that everyone has been talking about. And we got involved with initially the tocilizumab studies, so anti-IL-6 and Covactor study, which is a Roche product, and that read out this week and it was negative. So there's been a lot of different reports, so case report um, uncontrolled reports suggesting that anti-R6 treatment might be useful in COVID-19. This was the first placebo controlled study to report on um, anti-R6 and it is a global study and it did not improve, uh, did not reach its primary end point. I think, this is my own hypothesis, is that some of it, I think there are still some patients who may have benefited from anti-IL-6, but it's difficult in amongst all of the different types of COVID patients that you have. But secondly, I think it, my own feeling is that it's not quite enough. So anti-IL-6 wasn't enough to reduce the inflammation. We have since then designed a study to try to uh, reduce this inflammation. And the plan is to reduce the inflammatory part of it to stop people going either to ITU or dying from the COVID and we have a treatment um, study which will open next week where one arm is on fostamatinib, which is a sick inhibitor, which we believe will reduce the innate part of the immune system, which may be a main part of what's causing problems. And the third, second arm, which is a JAK-STAT inhibitor, and it's actually one of the older JAK-STAT inhibitors, ruxolitinib, and we use that because actually it's a very easy drug to upmarket. So if we do suddenly need to have hundreds of different 
you know, millions of patients on this type of treatment, that you can do that with this particular tablet. And it's against the standard of care. Um, I think, and certainly what um, we were hearing about earlier, so Dr. Holland, Dr. Professor Holland talking about the antiviral parts of it, the antiplasma, it seems to me this is going to be more like an HIV type treatment. You're going to need more than one type of treatment. So our study is aiming to reduce the inflammation. We would like to include an antiviral in that. So we're approaching some of the companies to see if we can actually include an antiviral part of it. There are a number of other studies targeting the immune system from the other point of view. And um, the way we have designed the study is to be an adaptive study so that we can include things including anticoagulations as well. So it's a complicated area now, I think. There are many, many different um, areas of study, um, but I think, I think that things will change over the next sort of six to 12 months. Can I ask a question? You, yeah. When you're talking now about adding an antiviral, now you're talking about a, a three drug cocktail. There's always uh, difficulty. No, no, they're not. So, it's, uh, so we are. Are you going to do that? Are you going to do a randomization to one, uh, yeah. one two, or three? Yes, totally. Absolutely. Okay, that's fine. Because yeah. the issue is, I was worried about the concept of really multiple drug regimens no, when you don't no. document things. It yeah. took a long time to go to multiple drugs in HIV. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, the other interesting thing, as you know, which you're talking about, they're all nice because except for the antiviral, you're really targeting the innate immune system. As you know, actually, there's a trial too of um, a, um, a C5 uh, inhibitor. Yeah. Echolizumab is also yeah. running their trial because of the Jeff Lawrence paper. Yeah. And, um, and then there's even a um, talk of starting a C3 inhibitor because if you block C3B, then you don't get the neutrophils migrating into sites of common activation and you don't get the activation. So. You know, there are a lot of studies going on targeting the innate immune system. I think that's, you know, really probably where you're going to get the best bang for your bucks, uh, particularly if they can find even better antivirals to suppress continued viral replication. Yeah, very much so. And I, and I think we have to seriously think about trial design. I mean, this is a pandemic where we want to very quickly lead out to decide if a drug is worth taking forward or not. And actually we do want a game changer. We don't just want to reduce the mortality in 5% or 10%. You actually want to really change it. So I think all of those things are sort of big challenges for us and um, trying to decide which is the right treatment. And we can be very hypothesis driven, but also we actually need to actually get the trials kind of up and running. So, and I think to explain to patients and people how important actually clinical trials are. You know, they, there was a lot of noise, a lot of talk about the anti-R6, the tocilizumab, and actually the RCT was, was negative. So designing a study properly is incredibly important. Um, and actually these sort of placebo controls, I think can be quite scary as a patient to understand it, but actually it's crucial to really understand whether a, a treatment works or not. Yeah, but you also are the advantage of always honestly telling patients we don't know if, in fact, there can be harm from this other treatment. Oh, it, no, it's so hard. That's, a, that's another advantage of making the decision for a randomized trial. Yeah, absolutely, completely. Earlier, um, Dr. Holland talked about the, the positive results of using dexamethasone to treat COVID in severely ill patients. Um, and now there's more studies looking at using steroids to also treat it. Uh, what are your thoughts for ITP patients who are currently being treated for their ITP with prednisone or dexamethasone? Would this be helpful or more harmful in the case of COVID? Uh, shall I, 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 I'm sure we all have an opinion on this, but I, I guess I, um, I don't think I know the answer fully to that. I think it is not, a, I think we have all for a very long time wanted to get people off steroids for a very good reason. So I think still think it's important for people to not be on high doses of steroids unless you have to be on it. And the actual being on lots of steroids might change your ability to fight the virus. But I think the dexamethasone study has been reassuring, certainly to our practice, that using high dose steroids up front for an acute ITP that might be associated with COVID, I think that's okay. And I certainly feel like I'm, I'm more comfortable and I feel more confident about using steroids up front and that it might reduce some of the other inflammation 
particularly the bleeds on the heads that we're seeing and whether there's a vascular component to that. And it may be that steroids are helpful in that context. Ming, how do you handle this in China? Yeah, I, I think for the newly diagnosed patient, uh, I don't think high dose dexamethasone is uh, suitable. Uh, maybe uh, prednisone or other uh, tpo a or other things, maybe IVIG. Why, why do you not like high dose dexamethasone? Um, I am afraid that um, in uh, in the early uh, stage, it, it might be too immune suppressive. Yeah, I think one of the things that I think you're reminding me of, and I'm sure everybody else was already thinking about this, that in the studies that have been done that demonstrated a benefit for dexamethasone, it's in a really ill hospitalized patient with either lung disease or at least on oxygen, whereas that's not the way we think of ITP patients who are being treated with steroids. So I think your comment, Ming, is very good for making that distinction. Nikki or Howard, do you have further comments on that? Well, I would say my own prejudice, we just talked about ITP treatment. I, I think I... Um, I kind of follow the, the prejudice of Bertin Godot, as you know, that uh, I want to actually, and I think looking at the randomized trials, you know, patients who come in with very low platelet counts that you really, the point that you really even think about hospitalization, I would prefer dexamethasone as an ITP treatment alone. We're not talking about COVID with the doses. And I'm, I'm even willing, as, as Bertrand goes, to use tepal agonist early on to try to shorten the hospital stay and at least get to a platelet count where he can manage an outpatient. And even studies that I've seen from China, where I've reviewed some of the studies that have come out of China, the rate of response for dexamethasone, one or two doses, one or two cycles, I should say, of four days, um, was associated with a faster response than prednisone although the duration of response is the same. But there were at least one study showed significantly less morbid for the next six to eight weeks, keeping them on prednisone, less overt diabetes, uh, less infections. So I think, again, uh, that's the issue. When it came to if someone came in with thrombocyte and COVID, uh, and it was significant COVID, I would have no trouble you know, in terms of thinking, particularly of respiratory symptoms of the doses that were used there. And I think it was six milligrams. It was not a very high dose. So I think, you know, I don't, I don't mind those doses. Um, but I think, you know, I, I, you know, I'm separating treatment of acute severe ITP patients from patients who have COVID or coming in with, particularly they're coming with thrombocytopenia COVID, that probably is a bad sign from looking at the yeah. literature. Would you agree? So yeah. I, th I think there's two different things though. I think um, there is, I, I think there is acute ITP in COVID that's different from the mild thrombocytopenia. I think the thrombocytopenia- I'm talking about, about patients who are symptomatic with respiratory thrombocytopenia. Yeah. Yeah, those patients. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. no, yeah. 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 yeah, but you're right. Someone could come in and be COVID positive and have thrombocytopenia. And I think now we're actually, any new patient that's come in with severe thrombocytopenia, they're all being, everybody gets screened that comes in the hospital nowadays. I have not seen that. I have to say, Jim and, and uh, Nikki, I have not seen a quote COVID brand new ITP uh, mm. patient. I have seen COVID patients develop thrombocytopenia with their infection. Um, but they have so many other things that are much more severe cases. And uh, we have at least in the county hospital here, a hospital full of COVID patients. And I don't really know about, you know, uh, and I've actually sent to um, a fellow to review the patients that are sent home, if any of them had even mild thrombocytopenia when they were just mildly symptomatic and sent back, because there's a program now the County of Los Angeles where patients are sent home but get regular calls at home and, um, and get regular monitoring and they have to have a 
so-called another person who is available to check in on them uh, with social distancing type of uh, environment. So again, I, I don't know those results, but I have not seen ITP and, and a patient and a brand new ITP and COVID together. Could, could we let Ming tell us whatever he would like to say about management of ITP related to COVID in his institution or in China, and then we can have a wrap up Q and A with whatever time is left. Okay. Uh, in my opinion, uh, for the chronic patient uh, with a mild and moderate COVID-19 infection, uh, they can remain uh, their uh, routine maintenance therapy. Uh, but for brand new uh, ITP, as I said, I avoid the use of high dose dexamethasone uh, and uh, uh, also a rituximab. Uh, I'm afraid that they are too immune suppressive for the COVID-19 infection. And uh, for the hypercoagulable state, I think monitoring is uh, necessary. However, the using of uh, anti-thrombotic prophylaxis, uh, I'm a little bit reluctant for that. Uh, since uh, COVID-19 patients with low platelet count, the risk of thrombosis, uh, I think, remains uh, low. And do you give IVIG to those patients to, uh, let's say, because I, I think like Howard said, and I believe it's Nikki's experience, our experience, and this is taken from Andrew Lee, who's my successor at Wild Cornell, um, most of the patients that are COVID infected have had pre-existing ITP and then dropped their count. So do you routinely monitor for COVID in terms of testing, if you have an ITP patient come in who may have relapsed, and do you use IVIG more freely in that patient population? Yes, I do. Yes to both? Yeah. Okay. Howard, do you want to make any further comments? No, I mean, I, I don't think so. I, we've only had two of our IT patients. ITP patients come in who required hospitalization for COVID. Both have recovered. Uh, they were younger patients. Um, uh, and, uh, and one who was um, actually uh, was in a kind of long-term remission having been treated actually with a toxin, uh, one of those rare uh, patients, um, uh, several years out after rituxan, he um, didn't drop his platelets. Uh, and it was a male too, that's more interesting. The other one, a woman uh, actually did come in and had significant thrombocytopenia and we gave IVIG to the patient and we gave TPO agonists. Um, and and um, she was moderately symptomatic and she had a, actually a relatively long course in the hospital but never really got significant uh, severe progression of respiratory illness. I would agree, I would not give her toxin to anybody for that because you know we really want that late development of antibodies and you know here's an innate effort to immunize you basically getting the infection and as shown by Donnie Arnold it's pretty hard to get immunized if you get rituxan uh, for an extended period of time. In fact if I had any new ITP patients now come in in the era of COVID I would not expose them to rituxan simply for hope that the vaccine is going to become available and they'll be able to be vaccinated. What do you say to that, Jim? What would you do? Um, I would, I, what I think we should do, if this is okay, I think those are great points. I think, Caroline, are there patient questions we, would, we should be considering here in the last few minutes? Yeah, there's a couple. I mean, Peter asked about end plate or l to boost platelet production. So should patients who are on those therapies for their ITP eliminate or reduce uh, the dose if they're diagnosed with COVID? Nikki? Uh, 
<laughs> okay, two, a few things. So being diagnosed with having SARS PCR is not COVID. So I think the 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 I think that the potential thrombotic or problematic problems are only in those patients with hyperinflammatory states. I am going to bounce that straight back to Howard to ask whether it actually, in fact, you might continue on the same dose, but add in an anticoagulation. If you don't have any significant severe symptoms and particularly respiratory symptoms, I would not change your dose if you're well controlled. I agree. Um, I think if you're an ITP patient and you're much more symptomatic, then, you know, where we talk about we want to keep patients, I think putting them into the hospital, not necessarily in an ICU setting. We do have non-ICU settings for COVID patients who are symptomatic, but you know, just watch them because I think you really, really don't know what's going to happen in terms of their platelet counts after that. But I think um, minimal symptoms are, are no symptoms, absolutely just having yeah. you know, uh, a positive test. Surprising that we've had very few of the people who tested positive on the medical campus. We're all repeated tested, I was tested a week and a half ago, um, we're always being retested. We haven't really, the majority of them go home, they stay at home for so many days, they get retested, and then they finally come back to work. So it's surprising that, you know, the majority of patients who have a positive test with no symptoms may not progress. Um, I think there are people, and I'm going to take the liberty of naming David Cooter, who basically feel you should manage ITP with or without COVID essentially the same. And I think that in the beginning, when this was first happening and it was around the time we had the first town hall, there were a lot of concerns about various aspects of COVID and the intersection with different treatments. And I would say by and large, almost none of them have panned out. We have had two patients with thrombosis, venous thrombosis, interestingly in the, in the setting of having relatively high platelet counts. But I think about the only thing you could consistently agree on at this point, though you've heard some very good comments about steroids, about rituximab, is trying to minimize any changes that are gonna require you to seek a whole bunch more medical care. So I agree with Howard and Nikki in the sense of if it's an otherwise asymptomatic patient, not changing your dose of a TPO agent. Ming, is that you? Are you okay with that too, or no? Yeah, I agree. Other questions, Caroline? So yeah, one more. Uh, this came up on the PDSA Facebook page last night, and we had over. 100 responses, um, and it was about hydroxychloroquine. And as we know, thanks to uh, the, the President of the United States, it's been in the news again this week, and Dr. Holland had said earlier that uh, it is not a treatment for coronavirus. And so there seems to be a bit of confusion um, among our ITP patient population. Some patients said they actually take it to treat their ITP, uh, some say they take it because they have lupus and ITP is a secondary condition. And then others thought that there was quinine in hydroxychloroquine. So they were a bit confused about that because we know quinine can cause thrombocytopenia. So uh, that's our last and final question that I would like to throw out to our uh, panelists. <laughs> well, um, let's, let me say one thing. There was confusion brought out recently because of some negative data that was published, which has now been shown to be false and been retracted in, in two papers. But there are trials that were more valid and, and perspective that has not supported at least a benefit for um, COVID. I think if you're on hydroxychloroquine for lupus, or even it has a role in antiphosphate antibody syndrome, and there's a trial now about using it as a prophylaxis in antiphosphate antibody syndrome, but particularly it has value in pregnancy and antiphosphate antibody syndrome. Um, I think you know you should stay on it as your rheumatologist or your you know, hematologist is prescribed. Um, but I would not take it simply for the fact that you think it's going to protect you from um, uh, 
uh, COVID. I don't think we have any data. I think that uh, I think you'll get more benefit from, from wearing a mask and stay, staying home if you can. Um, I'm curious uh, for the panelists. Have any of you seen cardiac problems with a patient on hydroxychloroquine? Not at the doses that we're doing, but remember the doses that were suggested in that initial report from China were a little bit higher than the, you know, 100 to 200 milligrams a day. Um, so I, you know, I, I, you know, I haven't seen any that's reported. Me? No. I haven't seen any. Because I think in rheumatology and in ANA positive ITP patients, you know, have had a test that are ANA positive, there's some data suggesting it's a good treatment for helping to manage the ITP. And generally, I think the toxicity is not thought to be high at all. But I agree with Howard completely. And that's an echo of what Steve Holland said. I don't think there's any good evidence that hydroxychloroquine is very useful currently under the way it's been tried for COVID. I'm gonna take the chair liberty of just trying to sum up a lot of the things we've heard briefly. I think Steve Holland in the beginning talked about dexamethasone and remdesivir being useful, but in patients who were at least severe, i.e. at least getting respiratory support or with pulmonary disease. Um, Charlotte talked about the variability of effects in immunodeficiency patients mainly being not that great and actually seeing kind of a flip side of what we've been talking about, the two phases of the disease, where maybe the patients had longer lasting disease and more minor symptoms, but may have had a benefit from not having as many inflammatory uh, components to it, the type that make you really sick with it. I think Bruce, Bruce Satius talked to us about uh, the uses and potential benefit of convalescent plasma. And while there's not an overwhelming randomized controlled trial, it seems that there was overwhelming data that it's going to be helpful, fits everything we know historically, and it's going to be tested in addition to being tested in hyperimmune products. Parenthetically, I think those of us who are ITP doctors and other doctors can be unhappy that it won't be in regular IVIG. Christy Marks told us about the vaccine studies and how they're making a lot of progress. And I think we've all been hearing about those in the news. Howard talked about the context of thrombosis in this disease, how it fits in the general inflammatory nature of atherosclerosis and brought up later potential risk, for example, with TIFO agents or patients who have other factors that contribute to thrombosis. Nikki, Hu Ming, and I talked a little about what we're seeing in ITP, mainly patients getting worse. And Nikki talked about this study, which is for COVID, but could also benefit ITP of using a sick inhibitor which is a licensed treatment of ITP now in the United States and in Europe, that's a very strong anti-inflammatory and that may benefit both the ITP and patients with COVID. So Caroline, let me turn it back to you and thank PDSA for the support of arranging all this. And of course, to thank Jeff Cooper. Caroline. Uh, helping us to organize this program today. Um, and of course, we'd like to thank all of our esteemed panelists for participating in the COVID-19 uh, ITP town hall update. And if you didn't get to see the entire program today, or if you wanna watch it again, it'll be available for viewing here on our Facebook page or on the ITP conference website for our conference attendees. And thanks to our Facebook members for participating in today's program and for your great, uh, great questions. We hope to see you in cyberspace at PDSA's 20th anniversary ITP conference taking place August 1st and 2nd. Thank you.